Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Zephyr, and I'm an associate professor here in the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Melbourne. And this is uh, QMNet, or the Quantitative Methods Network. And today we have, <clears throat> which is kind of an internal and informal group we maintain of quantitatively oriented researchers at the University of Melbourne and other universities at this point. And today we've got a really exciting speaker who's going to talk to us about something that sounds equally exciting. And the title of his talk, Gerald Powell from the uh, Salk Institute of Biology. And the title of his talk is How to Use Causality Without Correlation to Download Brains into Computers. Uh, just to introduce you, Gerald, uh, here. <clears throat> uh, Gerald obtained his uh, BS in biology at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, where he worked on the molecular evolution of signal transduction domains and membrane proteins. Uh, he obtained his PhD working on the tumor suppressor BRCA1. Uh, under Dr. Verma at the Salk Institute. This was followed by a postdoc uh, studying epigenetics, neuroscience, and genomics. He then trained with uh, George Sugihara, uh, who we both know, um, at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Applied Mathematics for Causal Inference and Nonlinear Systems. After, after becoming a staff scientist at Salk, he developed the Sugihara uh, EDM or Empirical Dynamic Modeling Equation Free Method for Molecular Biology and Neuroscience. In the last few years, <coughs> excuse me, it's just COVID, it's no big deal. In the last few years, he has been a part, <laughs> a part uh, has been, has spent a part of a year visiting uh, at the AIST, the Artificial Intelligence Research Center at uh, the Information Technology Research Institute in Tokyo and Tsukuba in Japan. And using the ABCI supercomputer, uh, he's worked on the development of CCM or convergent cross mapping causal inference methods for big data and scalability and high performance computing uh, through optimization of both software and hardware. Uh, late last year, he joined Vertex Pharmaceuticals, where he is now the head of quantitative biology, as well as a visiting scientist at Salk and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UCSD. <coughs> Excuse me. That sounds really, uh, really cool. And thank you so much, Gerald, for, uh, for agreeing to do this. Um, research sounds great. Now, feel free to take it away. Thank you for inviting me. And it's like, um, so today I want to let me get this in here now. So I want to share with you something that sounds um, at face value um, kind of not so easy to believe, but if you actually bear with me through the next uh, 45 minutes, an hour or so, um, I'll try to convince you that it's like this is a realistic prospect now with a convergence of technology, both in um, data acquisition as well as computational methods that allow us to do this thing. So, okay. So if we start from the very beginning, one thing is very common that we do things with correlation. And here's a case you can see like divorce rate in Maine and per capita consumption of margarine. Obviously these things are causally not related or we don't think they are. And then it's like, but you know, these things are very correlated. But also if we actually take the statistical methods that we use that if you actually look at things, let's say you compare two conditions this is like in my uh, neighborhood, like La Jolla Cove. If you go in the water, look in the morning and look in the afternoon, you see the differences. And they said, I wanna look at the differences between these two conditions, morning, afternoon, and what's the difference between the two. I could take a statistical view and take like 10 random frames of movie one and 10 random frames of the other movie two, and then look at what's the mean and standard deviation. And that's what you get at the bottom. So basically what you see at the bottom, I mean, you can see differences, but you're kind of missing the point. So if you don't look at if, if the system is intrinsically dynamical, and then you actually look at it in a static way, you're going to miss a lot just by using statistics. So the framework in which we are working in is basically uh, manifolds from time series. So what are these manifolds? So manifolds are basically you actually have projections then in you know this thing called phase space, and in this case. All there is, is basically time series. This is Lorentz system defined by three ODEs. And if you look at here, the X axis here, you have a time series and you see how the time series evolves over time and how it projects into phase space. Of course, you have also a Y variable and a Z variable. And you can see there are like three time series and the three time series as they project into phase space have a relationship to each other. And that relationship is defined by that manifold that you actually see there. So. This is basically the framework that we do everything. This is the, these manifolds and we use these manifolds. So you can actually go from, you know, from the manifold to the time series and you go, for, go from the time series to manifolds. And um, 
that's why everything that we do is to take time series to avoid that statistical approach to things where we can actually take in like basically frames of a movie. So this all kind of started by an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz called James Crutchfield, who is the head of, um, I think of the uh, Chaos Research Center at UC Davis. But when he was, a, when he was uh, an undergraduate in his thesis, he came up with what was later to be known as the Tuckins theorem. And basically what they actually, the paper that they published, and these were basically a bunch of, one undergraduate student and couple graduate students and a postdoc that, um, that basically show how to do the Stockens theorem, which is basically this uh, delayed coordinate embedding. And what this, what this tells you is basically, so ultimately it carries the name Tuckins theorem because it was informally proven by Flores Tuckins at the University of Honingen. But here, actually, you can see the Rossler attractor. And what uh, Crutchfield, Packard, Farmer, and Shaw showed is basically that if you actually take uh, a, out a single variable that you actually have, you can actually generate a manifold that is a diffeomorphism, basically a stretch form of the other one. So you can actually stretch this one into the other one. And here, I'm going to show you with the Lorentz. Maybe it's easier to see. So if you actually look at the... <clears throat> at the at the basically the Lorenz attractor, you have X, Y, and Z, but you can actually take just time series of X. And if you take that time series of X and then do a delay of that by amount tau and displace it by this arbitrary amount tau, and then an arbitrary amount two tau, you get three new time series, the original one X, and then X minus T and X minus two T. If you actually project this into phase space and embed it into phase space, you get a new attractor that you can actually see is you know, superficially has some similarity it has like two lobes. And actually you can actually see, you could actually stretch this one into this one. So therefore it's a diffeomorphism. So this actually allows you to do a whole bunch of things. And um, here, I'm just gonna have an illustration of the Tuckins theorem. And this is basically, um, so here you actually have the X, X minus tau and X minus two tau. And if you project this into, you know, you see they're exactly the same thing. They're just delayed with respect to each other. I'm gonna fast forward. If you just project this into phase space, you generate this so-called shadow manifold of X. So this is the delay embedded form of X. You this, this axis is X of T, X T minus tau and X minus two tau. And you can see every point that exists in, in the shadow manifold of X exists as an equivalent point where the nearest neighbors are preserved on the original Lorenz attractor. So how, how does this insight actually useful? So for example, a way to use this is let's say here you have a, a time series and then the question is whether is this chaotic or is it uh, is chaotic or is it actually a random noise? So the way we actually do this is like, we're gonna embed this library, like the first half, and we're gonna to try to forecast the second half. So basically this is like a, a two-fold cross-validation, whether there actually is information in this thing to predict the second half. So the way you actually do this, you know, it'll be something like this. So this is, these are a two time series, and then we're gonna take the first time point, let's say this, and we're gonna call this X. We take the second time point, we call this Y, and then we're gonna plot this on this plane, which is basically X and Y. And then we have the first point. Then we just go do the same thing. We move over. So now we take the second point and call that X and the third point, we call that Y. And then plot the, you know, the vector of these two again. And as you do this, you start see in the chaotic system, you start finding some regularities, whereas you have no regularities whatsoever in this two dimensional projection of that one dimensional time series. In the, in the system that's basically noise. And you can actually carry this further. So you can actually go to more dimensions. You can actually go like, you know, three dimensions. And as you can see here in three dimensions, everything becomes unambiguous. So you can actually have like X, Y, Z, like it just becomes completely predictable. You can see like, if you had like X and Y, you can tell exactly what Z is gonna be. So 
if you actually take real time series, you can do the same thing. And then you can predict also like how many dimensions do you get optimal predictions? For example, in this case, you can actually see that, you know, if you had one dimension, it did this, it did better predictions at <clears throat> with two dimensions and three dimensions. But then as you add more and more dimensions, actually it the the predictability goes down. So that in the real cases, this is the case in real data, this is the case because you start having noise. So when you dilute your good information from the delay embedding, but you dilute it with noise of these irrelevant time series and I mean, so ir ir irrelevant time points at time scales that don't really matter to the process. And this is very much like, for example, if you were to predict weather, you know, the weather of yesterday and the day before yesterday maybe was really relevant for the predicting the weather tomorrow, but the weather like two weeks or two months ago is probably irrelevant. So adding that information in, you know, dilutes your good information with bad information. That is like, then um, you're gonna do, you're gonna predict worse. So Sugihara so actually took this method, you know, this insight from Tuckton's theory a step further. And in 2012, he published this paper um, that allow you to do causal inference using Tuckton's theorem. And the way this is actually done, let's see, is uh, using two time series. So as, as you saw that if you do the shadow manifold of X as related to this basically latent manifold, let's say we don't really know, we, let's say we have two variables, you know, X, Y, Z, but you don't know all of them. You, have, you don't have observations for all of them. But you know, you can actually have the manifold, the shadow manifold of X. And let's say you also have the shadow manifold of Y. So if they're both part of the original same system that let's say you don't know, you can actually test if let's say the nearest neighbors that exist in shadow manifold of X are equivalent, you know, nearest neighbors of shadow manifold of Y. And if you have nearest neighbors, you can also use it to predict what's the next time point gonna be. So you can actually predict, you know, the future values of X based on Y and, the, and basically uh, predict the future values of Y uh, based on X. So if you actually do this based on the uh, principle that they share nearest neighbors, you can actually see um, if these things are causally related. So one thing that is like, if they're causally related, you know, you should be able to predict one with the other one. And this is essentially what you do. So basically the, let's say you don't know this, you make a, you know, shadow manifold of X, a shadow manifold of Y, and you try to predict across. And if you cannot, if you can predict because of the system was part of the same, you know, part of the same causal net, uh, network, then you'll be able to find some predictability across and then you know they're causally related. So using this insight, um, we actually um, improved on the original uh, algorithms Sugihara. So you can actually have, basically you have the observations, the time series that you see, then you generate embeddings, and then you actually do um, K nearest neighbor searches. And then uh, after that, you, um, in the in the new version of the Sugihara, this is basically what KH is gonna talk about next week, how we actually made this a more efficient algorithm and uh, using CCM. So in general, we think of correlation and causation, something like this. So most people think that this, um, many things in the world are correlated and some of them within there are causal. But what we say is like, maybe there are some other things, they're causal, like the, like the part here, but they're not correlated. So this, for most people, especially for biologists, that's a counterintuitive thing because everybody's thought, you know, is taught that first you look for correlations and then you test experimentally whether actually these are causal. So nobody ever thinks of looking for things that are uncorrelated and causal. So that's kind of surprising. So here we actually um, take basically time points of measuring RNA. We actually took time points of um, cells growing over time. And then we actually followed them. And you actually have like three genes, this uh, CLIN3, CLIP2, and SWITCH4. It doesn't really matter what they are, but you can actually see these three genes change over time. And they're actually uncorrelated. If you actually take, for example, SWITCH4 and CLIN3 and look the relationship between each other, you know, if you try to apply a linear fit, it's really, really terrible. It's less than 0 0.1. So, but if I tell you that you, if you connect, you know, time point one to time point two to time point three in phase space, this is what you see. You actually see that there is some regularity in the whole thing. So these are like through, to, through, through two cell cycles, 
So this have this this entire process happened twice. And you can see the trajectory is actually kind of match. And they're kind of, I mean, there is some variance between the first and the second run of the whole thing. But you can see that in many parts, this thing is like follows uh, the, the thing. If you were to try to predict, let's say, given a certain value of switch four, where is what is clin three going to be? And you have to predict like the future value of it. Sometimes in this case, in particular, you will be hard pressed because there are these overlaps here. These are the singularities where they overlap. So in the two dimensional projection of this has these singularities where you actually have ambiguity in terms of where it's going to be the future point. So you can actually solve this like the same that we did the, um, by adding a dimension. And in this case, adding a dimension is adding a gene. So actually, if you look at this, this manifold out of the three genes now has no points that are crossing each other and it has no singularities. So by calculation, we actually found that actually this network is not only three genes, but actually four genes. So there's a fourth gene called we 5 in this case, and all these four genes are uncorrelated to each other, but they are actually causally related. And these are the uh, correlation coefficients of observers as expected uh, versus predicted of uh, using CCM there, that establishes the causal relationship between these genes. Okay. I think, I think um, Young Seo, please, can you um, mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, okay, so let me go back here. So these are, so in order to prove, experimentally prove that you actually have causality without correlation, we decided to do an experiment. And the experiment would be like, we're gonna change the behavior, we artificially control we 5 and we actually officially alter the levels of we 5 Then if they're causally related, the behavior of these three other genes, they're you know, supposedly causally connected, they should change in some way. And that's actually what we did. So we, we, we basically artificially control the levels of we 5 and then observe the change in trajectory so basically the light colored lines that you see there, you can see this is the trajectory of what happened after we you know, altered the levels of we 5 and some change more than others. But you can see, if you look at the manifold, the solid black line is the original manifold. And when we actually alter the levels of we 5 this manifold basically changes trajectory. So this is an experimental proof of existence of causality without correlation. And we can actually just generalize this with a univariate form. So basically univariate form is like, if you actually do this experiment twice, you know, you, you run this, if you don't change anything, the manifolds become very predictable, but then you change we five, you know, you can see a change in the trajectories. And then these are all these genes that were predicted to be um, basically uncorrelated, but causal to each other. And we actually did with um, what we call overexpression where you, raise the level of the expression of the gene, or you do a knockout, you just eliminate, basically you kill it by making a mutation and then see how these uh, connected genes that are supposed to be causal are changing in expression. And this is basically what you see. So we actually did this genome wide. So here you actually have the causal map of all the genes versus all the genes in yeast. And so we can actually you know, cluster these and find basically these columns and rows. So the columns are basically like all these things are causal to this one gene that's on the top. And then the effects that you actually have are basically the rows. So basically you can actually find cause and effect of all the genes under this particular condition that you actually sampled. So how frequently we're correct. So, and we actually over 70% correct. So the experiments that we actually, this is a lower bound because for example, a certain gene might only respond to you overexpressing it. Another gene might only um, be, be able to respond if you basically turn it off. So we can only do the experiment in one direction. So therefore, the change that we actually see are sort of a lower bound. So when we actually did, um, when we predicted this, uh, we said that it would change, uh, the expected change is but we actually see that over 70% of our predictions were correct. So that goes, that is uh, compared to a baseline. So there was a competition called uh, Dream 5 that um, with that same, uh, also done in yeast, 
the, predicted, uh, the prediction accuracy was about 3%. So when does this causality without correlation happen? So this is basically a, a condition of state dependence. So state dependence basically, if all the conditions are correct and get integrated, then you actually have causality without correlation because each of the individual, let's say inputs that you actually have are not correlated with the outcome, but in some combination of this, you can think of it as a sort of a Boolean, uh, a Boolean statement. I have to have this one and this one and, 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 and not to this one, then the outcome will change in some way. And this is actually what we see. So for example, in this particular gene, YHP1, where we calculated for these target genes to change, they depend on the stress response, on zinc, you know, uh, the carbon source, you know, whether there's sulfur and sulfur amino acids, and then what it affects, it affects the copper response and affects, for example, nitrogen degradation. And these are the things that get affected. And this is um, basically, this is another case where you have to prove, you know, causality without correlation. And it's basically the signal integration event. And it's basically taking all the, uh, that are basically the determine this, um, where you actually see this causality without correlation in these biological networks. And we also did it with mice. And then um, this is just to, uh, one slide to show that how much nonlinearity there is. So although most people use these um, linear models for gene expression, when you actually look at it carefully, uh, we actually estimated the amount of, uh, the number of genes that are actually better described by a nonlinear model than a linear model is in the range between you know, <clears throat> 75% and uh, 84%. So the majority of them are probably nonlinear in any behavior. So, okay, so let's, I'm gonna switch gears now and we're gonna move now to this, um, to uh, neuroscience. And the system that we're using is the zebrafish. Zebrafish is a, this fish, um, it's basically transparent. And then, and that's why we can image the entire brain. And we actually have transgenic fish. Let's see. Let's see if I got. Is this that? Okay, so you can see the fins moving. In this case, the only the head here is embedded and the tail is free just to show you that there's movement, that the fish is alive. Otherwise, and here we actually give it a, like a low oxygen in the water. And when it feels that there's like low oxygen, it tries to escape. And this is kind of response. But in the real experiment, we cannot have the tail free because if the tail is free, then it shakes too much. And then we cannot capture all the signals that actually happen in the brain. And if you actually look at that, this is the signal that we get. So every dot that you see there is an individual neuron. We put the sensor for calcium that tells you whether a neuron is firing into the, into the nucleus of, the, of each individual neuron. And um, basically what you actually look here over time is basically the activity of every single neuron during this low oxygen escape behavior. So this is the initial data that we have. And uh, a zebra first brain has uh, roughly 120,000 neurons. We can capture anywhere between 50 and well, a little bit over 110,000 neurons uh, per fish brain, depending on the data set. So, in order to do this, just to understand the scale of the problem, initially when we thought that we were gonna to try to do this, when I was doing it on my laptop, it was gonna take over 4,600 years to do this. So that was obviously not possible. So we actually um, went and had we tried to, you know, first run it with a C++ code that was faster than the original R code. And that was gonna take about nine hours on ABCI that at the time was like, I think the, fifth or seventh fastest supercomputer in the world. And we actually did that and then ran it on ABCI, but that was run basically on the CPUs. Basically that's on the Intel Xeon goals that you actually have on it, of which, um, but you know, not everybody has access to a $200 million computer. So we actually want to democratize this and make it like more usable for more people. And also, you know, if you actually look at what has happened over the last uh, 40 years, you know, Moore's law has been slowing down already since, you know, 2010, but GPUs have, you know, you know still gotten fast at a, linear, uh, at a linear rate. So GPU is where it's at in terms of acceleration right now. So if we actually can use the GPUs of which uh, ABCI has many, 
then uh, we would be probably better off. And then uh, we came up with um, a redesign of the CCM algorithm that Keiichi Takahashi is gonna tell you more about next week. And this was the initial thing that uh, we, you know, put the board where we actually thought it up. And then that was done also with uh, Wasafon, who is um, who's a graduate student with Keiichi. And uh, Joseph Park made the C++ version or the original C++ version of, um, of CCM. So anyway, so that's basically what uh, this MPEDM is like this massively parallel EDM that you hear about. So at the end of it, just to tell you like this, uh, compared to C++, you actually had an algorithm that was like 1,533 uh, folds faster than the original CPP EDM run at ABCI. And um, if you compare that now the, you know, Previously, it was run at eight and a half hours on 512 nodes of ABCI. Now you could actually do it on 33 minutes and one node. So that's like a very significant increase. And if you compare it to the beginning of our, when we were first started, when we were going on a laptop, you know, using R, that's like 122 million folds faster since, you know, since we started this in like around 2017. So what kind of things can you get out of this? So one of the things that you know, I told you, you can actually figure out how complicated is the signal for every neuron. So here we actually look at, you know, under normal oxygen, which we call normoxia, and then under hypoxia, which is low oxygen when the fish is trying to escape. And it's basically like, so we ask like, what is the dimensionality of each neuron and how many neurons are at what dimensionality? Interestingly, at one dimension, there are very few neurons in both cases, but what you can see is like, these high dimensional neurons that exist in the normal, um, you know, basically the a fish going about its day, uh, doing its own thing until it tries to escape, you actually see the dimensionality decrease. So you can actually see a shift to the left here towards lower dimensionality. So this peak also does, is not here. Basically everything is kind of shifting down and the dimensionality is decreasing and the, and the, basically, and the behaviors of the neurons is also simplifying. You can see the majority of the information. So this is basically the prediction accuracy and the density that you actually see here is basically how many neurons you actually see that are uh, of, this, of this type of pred the predictability and what dimensionality. So we go from one dimension up to 20 dimensions and no predictability to you know, perfect predictability there. So you can see the majority of it is uh, sort, of, sort of low dimensional and there's a small amount of stuff that is high dimensional that you can see at the very top edge there. So where do these high dimensional and low dimensional neurons is? And where, do they, where are they? So for example, you can see the, the lo low dimensional ones are here in yellow and the high dimensional ones in blue. And you can see, for example, in this area, the visual tectum, this actually is high dimensional and it's only as complicated as the visual signals that come from the, from the outside world. So they actually don't change. So the visual input, because they reflect exactly the visual input, these things don't change over time. But for example, the movements, since they become like stereotype, these are the motor areas of the fish. And these actually can see that they became more yellow. That means that these uh, movements or the activity of those neurons actually became simplified. If you actually look at the interaction matrix, you can see that of, this is the CCM matrix of the entire uh, fish brain. You can see under normal oxygen conditions and the, the hypoxic conditions, this became much more yellow and much more connected. So you can actually see that it became much more homogeneous and also like, um, and, and you can see the signal actually increases. So it becomes much more yellow indicating that um, that the connectivity is greater. Basically, you just focus the fish on this escape behavior. It just didn't care about anything else because now that is like low oxygen, nothing else matters. And all its behaviors are geared towards basically escaping. If you actually take a number of representative neurons here and you cluster them, you can find classes of behaviors. So you can actually find different classes of behaviors under normal oxygen. And when it tries to escape, you can see it becomes much more homogeneous. So this increase in homogeneity so the brain is basically all coordinated towards one task and the dimensionality increases. And also you can see most homogeneous, everything is sort of consistent. So we have a trick up their sleeve. So uh, as you remember, we talked about causality without correlation. So here we actually can take like basically the CCM matrix and then we can 
just take the correlation matrix between all the neurons and then subtract one from the other one. So basically you take the CCM matrix, the correlation matrix, and then subtract one from the other one, and then look at the residuals. So if you actually look at the residuals, as I mentioned to you earlier, the, you know, the horizontal lines is basically um, the signals that go out, basically when you're broadcasting, and the signals you're integrating are on the columns there. So here, basically, there's a, these are the non-redundant signals. Why non-redundant? Because you subtract a correlation. So if the things are very correlated, those will be canceled out because uh, they're identical. So if you actually look at the things that are not identical and are still remaining, they're basically where non, the non-linear signal is basically dominant, you'll find things that basically were things integrated. So for example, you can see this particular neuron here is integrating signals from these all these other neurons on these, uh, you know, <clears throat> on the uh, on here you can see they integrated into this neuron here. So this is under the low oxygen, and then here you can actually see there's a different neuron that does it under you know normal oxygen condition. So basically, the, who is integrating what signals you can actually get from this. So this is actually kind of a way to, you know, filter information and do a dimensionality reduction where you remove all the redundant signals. So we call this uh, you know, causal compression. So what kind of things do you find? So let's say this is an example of you actually find a manifold of three neurons, basically two neurons, and it's basically in the fish turn behavior. So basically with this manifold, you can actually um, predict every turn of the fish. And here I'll show you. So this is basically uh, every peak that you see here, that's a turn of the fish. And then if you actually take those two neurons that you actually have there, and if you were to make a box around here, you could actually see when it's gonna go and make this big loop. And every time of the, it makes one of these big loops, then you would actually make a turn. And actually you can predict these a half a second ahead whether the fish is gonna turn based on the information that you get from these two neurons. So unfortunately, one of these neurons were already known. So in a way it's nice because you, you know, data that are already pre-existing data in literature, people actually found this neuron called the velocity position neural integrator. So this is basically um, a known neuron. The other neuron was not known. So that combination of those two neurons actually can predict the turns of the fish. We also found that there's another paper from 2018 that found that, uh, that studied the fish in response to CO2 and found that some of these things where we actually look at um, something we'll call directed asymmetry index, where it's basically, where is the fish, uh, which neuron is receiving more inputs than, than outputs? And then as um, when you actually, re where, is, where is actually information integrated? And these areas where you actually are um, integrated information um, in the low oxygen condition are partially overlapping with what people found are the places where CO2 is sensed. I mean, CO2 is not identical to low oxygen, but it's sort of related. So it makes sense and is kind of satisfying to see that uh, we're finding you know, many of the same areas, not all, but many of the same areas um, during this low oxygen uh, stimulus. So how do you go from this into downloading the brain? Uh, this is what we're gonna talk about next. So we're gonna take the same tricks that, we, that I showed you before. And basically the goal would be, you know, we want to eventually go take the whole brain neuroactivity at single cell resolution, extract the relationship between the neurons during CCM, convert these uh, relationships into something that can be transferred into a computational framework. And then uh, basically then we were, basically we would actually test the performance on these and biosimilar robots in the future. So in this particular case, we took data from, um, from a Drosophila. And the reason we use this is because this Drosophila you can see on the right side is actually sitting on a styrofoam ball. So you can actually record the movements of the Drosophila while it's moving there. With the fish before, you know, the fish is basically embedded in this agarose. So it's immobilized. We can only infer movements, but we cannot observe them directly. In this case, we can actually observe the, you know, the fly directly and see its movements. And at the same time, we use this called light field microscopy. And then we actually observe all the activity in the brain. So you can see the activity in the brain. And uh, we use an, uh, independent component analysis to 
to assess basically like basically dynamic component analysis will give you um, the different parts of the you know the not basically the the different independent signals that you actually get by decomposition they might not be adjacent all of them but it's basically um, the independent signals from this. So from that, we actually generate a time series and then we did CCM. And this is basically your CCM matrix of those 80 areas of the, of the fly brain. And this is, then these are the movements. So this is the forward motion speed and this is the left right motion speed. And this is an example of a manifold that you actually get uh, from a neuronal area. So a, as you can see the dimensionality, the dimensionality is predominantly low dimensional like it's just the same as you saw before with the fish. There's a predominant low dimension and a small fraction that's high dimensional. So now it's like you can see after that we cluster this, you could actually think, okay, some of these things, you could, you could take this time series and that will be a representative of this group. And you can say this time series and that will be a representative of that group, right? So basically you could actually do this, uh, basically dimensional reduction by saying, okay, I'm just gonna take a few you know, a few neurons that represent that. And I could just take maybe the same as your average, you know, embedding dimension. We should take at least that many. And then basically if you take those, you could actually make a manifold that we say is roughly representative of the, of the, of the behavior of the flag. And, but we can actually do something better here. The same thing that I showed you before, we can take the CCM matrix. We can subtract the correlation from it and we get this, uh, we call row diff, and that's basically the, the excess predictability that you get from CCM over correlation. So this is basically your non-redundant signals. And out of these, we're going to build a whole bunch of manifolds. So how we will go about this? Let's say we want to talk, uh, we want to look at the movement of the fly, and we'll start with, so we, let's say we want to look at the forward movement. So the forward movement that we actually have we're gonna get the time series of the forward speed. And then we're gonna take the best predictor of the forward speed. This is time series 49. And then time series 56 is a close second. So we take these three that are actually show up on here. And then we put these together into a manifold. And we're gonna say, this manifold is gonna predict the forward speed. And then we're gonna take the forward speed and then make a manifold that has the left right speed and the forward speed. And then the best time series that we have here that predicts the left right speed. So in this way, you can you know, share time series that you have between manifolds, independent manifolds that you will construct. And here I just arbitrarily picked there to be three dimensions just for the, so I can draw them, but there are actually more dimensions than that. And actually it's a combination of actual time series and delays, because there could be observations that you actually have of behaviors that are actually in the network, but you didn't directly observe. So in order to account for that, you can actually add a few delays. And that's given by this, that, that you can actually do. So, so there was a paper by uh, Dale and Sugihara that showed that you can actually mix delays with real variables. So for example, if you actually had you know, if you actually have the original uh, X, Y, Z of the Lorenz attractor, you could actually have a delay embedding of, of basically of, uh, of Y, and then you can have a delay embedding of Z, but you can here, you can actually mix, let's say, uh, you know, Y, a delay of Y and Z. And then you can actually get basically the same result that you have with tokens, but with what you call a mixed embedding, which is, has a mixture of delays and actual real variables. And the, basically the delays are sort of like a placeholder that contains the same information as the real variable that you might not have observed. So when you actually do this and do a mixed embedding where you actually have shared uh, manifolds, well, it should be manifolds that have shared time series, and then you pass the result of one to the other one, then it's basically uh, you generate a network out of this. So in this one, for example, we had your left, right, forward, and time series 54. We have this one that's basically trying to predict forward, which had time series 56, 49, and forward, and forward value gets passed on here. And then you can build, which is gonna, another manifold for 
optimizing prediction of time series 49, another time series, or another manifold that optimizes prediction of time series 56, and so on and so forth. And you can just build the, and you, you can build the network that way. So if you do this, then you basically, um, you take the data, you make the row diff matrix, other row diff, you actually make manifolds based on these. And then you take it with a dimensional uh, with a dimensionality that's sufficiently high. And each of these things is gonna predict each other. So you make the network you, and you do it with an acyclic directed graph. And then you basically uh, generate like future movements. So basically you have this graph of manifolds and network of manifolds and you're just asking the, nap, the, the network of manifolds is predict for me what's gonna be the next step. And then if you take the next step, then it says like, I'm just gonna assume that prediction that I have is true. And then I'm gonna ask you to take the present state and then predict the time step after that. And you just keep iterating this. And as you iterate this, you just produce basically uh, future states based on the present state that you actually predicted. So that predicted state is basically you take it at, for a space value as, as a verse real. So the network that you generate is something like this. So this is the network of the fly. And it's pretty good at predicting things. So basically this is a prediction of, um, well, here is basically a prediction of you know, neuronal activity. So you can see it's pretty good. And then it's basically, this is predicting of left, right speeds. And you can see the observation of predictor pretty much. And that's just a, as a prediction task, okay? But now we're gonna have a generated task. Basically, yeah, you're gonna generate new behaviors. So this is the training data for forward speed. So if you use like typically, let's say if you make a manifold out of just time series 49, a univariate, you know, tokens embedding, and then you try to, to do the same thing as okay, predict the future state and then predict one after that and so on and so forth. It gets into these uh, trap dynamics. So it gets stuck and it doesn't, if you see the predicted stuff, the, is it the generated movements do not look very real. However, if you use a, you know, a more complex one, which is basically the generative manifold network, the network that we generated, you can see the motions that you actually get, the predicted forward speeds, the generated forward speeds look pretty realistic. You can say, well, okay, this is but just by eye, right? And you actually, um, you do it, th that was for forward speed, and this is for time series 49, which is, um, which is, a, which is a brain activity. The brain activity also looks pretty realistic coming out of it. If we, so just to have like uh, some real measure, so for example, here I show you the forward speed, the spectrum of the force. So it's the Fourier transfer. This is the spectrum of the behavior to see how similar is the spectrum. So this was the real spectrum. And this is the manifold network generated spectrum of forward speed. And this is basically the, the best neuron injected, uh, basically the best neuron that we had that generated the, the, the spectrum of that. And you can see that the correlation coefficient between the between what you actually had from the manifold network and the real one is pretty good. So observed versus generated, the correlation coefficient of the spectrum is 0.92. So I mean it's it's fairly similar. If you actually look at the these were the original movements, a little bit coarse grain here. So you got basically this is the forward speed and left right speed of the fly out of the network, you actually generate like this. But if you were to say, like I said, maybe the movements themselves can predict its future behavior. So you actually try to embed the movement itself and you try to do it without the brain activity, this is what you get. So the movement itself cannot generate the behavior that looks realistic, but the movement plus the brain activity can. Okay. So this is something of a surprise. So we actually used these, like the first 600 time points here as the training data, and we withheld this portion of the data. And as you can see in the withheld data, but not in the training data, there were these pauses. However, when we actually ran this thing in generative mode, where you actually generate artificial, you can actually saw pauses come up. 
So this was really strange to us because these pauses, these pause behaviors did not exist in the training set. So this suggests to us that, you know, there is something in the network that you're actually capturing from the, even from the training set that is able to generate realistic behaviors that are not explicitly present in your training set. So you're not just reproducing the training set, but you're capturing extra features that are in the behavior, but not obvious that can actually, um, that you can, that, that can actually be generated. So some of these things are a little bit strange. We don't quite understand them. You can actually have these really low amplitude oscillations. There's not quite a flat pause like in the real one, but you have these really low amplitude things and then it breaks out of it and then it, uh, so here you actually see the blue one is basically forward speed and the, and the orange one is left right speed. So basically this was, uh, the top part is like left and the bottom part is right. And you, it does superimpose, so you can actually get a picture of how the two are related to each other over time. So we decided to also to have a validation scheme of this to see like how realistic is this. So we actually have to have a metric, a metric to see how similar is this. And the most rigorous metric that we could think of is basically is like this. So, so we're gonna make the the GMN, the manifold network, and we're gonna have the generated manifold network produce this artificially generated data. So if this artificial generated data is you know, really realistic, the manifold that you actually generate out of that, that should actually have some skill predicting the withheld data that was never used. So this is real data. So we're using artificial data that's generated from the GMN and then try to embed that and use that to predict withheld data that was never used to build it. So basically using artificial data to predict real data. So if you actually do this, uh, oh, so basically this is just to show you that comparison with uh, other types of models that we actually use. So here we actually have like the GMN produced. This is basically uh, left right movements and this is the forward movement. The orange one is also the generated ones. And then we actually use also uh, what we call a flattened network. So basically the flattened network is, um, okay, oh, here's like, uh, this is basically left, right and forward movements alone. And then we actually had this flattened network that was basically taking all 80 time series and making one 80 dimensional manifold and letting it uh, run forward. And then you can actually get these uh, trap dynamics where it just keeps repeating the same thing forever. If you actually do a vector autoregressive one, it this one just explodes and it's not really, and if you use a K nearest neighbor one, you actually get, uh, basically it just collapses and it becomes like uh, zero. And here's basically a comparison of both together. And this is, this is basically the, trajectories of the simulated movement. This is the true data. This is the pattern of movement, left, right speed versus forward speed. This is the GMN, left, right, and forward speeds. This is the left, right, and forward movements alone, just using the movements, the historical movements of the fly to predict future movements of the fly. And this was the flattened network. This is the vector autoregressive, and this is the K nearest neighbor one. So you can see this is probably the most similar one that we can find. And if you compare it across every single brain area, if you compare uh, the prediction skill of, uh, of the embeddings of the generated data compared to uh, the real data, this is the skill that you see with e each method, but this is not very, um, this is a statistical thing, but not every single brain area is equally uh, easy to predict. And if you actually were to compare, uh, compare it across each brain area, this is the blue line that you see there is the GMN skill. And the, in almost every case, it's better than the other ones. So it basically tells you it's more realistic than any of the other methods in terms of generating brain, uh, natural brain-like data. And you can actually do the same thing for the spectrum of it. So see how, how similar is the spectrum of these things that you actually generate. And here again, the blue one is uh, in almost all cases most similar. So can we actually do this? So we actually did this with like 80 brain areas with a fly. So can we actually do this as whole brain uh, single neural resolution? And this is in order to do this, 
we actually, since the actual fish was not really moving because with the way you have to do the microscopy, you have to, you know, immobilize the fish in order to be able to record the, uh, the brain activity. Otherwise it shakes too much. And then you cannot, basically, you cannot, um, you cannot, uh, basically you cannot register all the neurons. So then what we did is sort of like a next best thing. Basically, we actually take it from the spinal cord, these signals that come out. So from the left side and the right side, we actually say, like, try to see what is the activity of the left motor neurons and the right motor neurons. And then we actually see, um, can we actually predict the pairs of left and right motor neurons? And then that's sort of a surrogate that we could actually use of the real fish movement. And you can actually see here, we actually have uh, left and right neurons, but you can see this is basically the real data. And this is basically the generated data of left. And this is like the uh, right side. You actually have the uh, real data and this is the generated data. So it looks fairly realistic. And then you can actually see the, the manifolds that you actually generate out of it. You know, left motor neurons and right motor neurons, they all look, uh, you can actually find realistic solutions to it. So this basically like, this just tells you that you can actually do this at whole, whole brain resolution, is at a whole brain scale at single neuron resolution. You know, we couldn't get the actual movement of them. So we actually put it on, uh, we wanna put this on the, um, basically on a robotic fish and let it swim based on this kind of thing. Uh, that's sort of in, still in the works. So then as I said, can we actually do it with human data? So here we actually did with human data. And this is basically a visual task. And there's a human basically joystick uh, task. And this is basically the, these are sort of outcomes. Basically this is the human uh, joystick input that you actually have based on this. Uh, this is basically the CCM. And this is the, CC, uh, the row diff that you actually generated out of it. So uh, same procedure, but this is for human uh, fMRI data. And then you can actually see that, you know, you can generate fairly realistic human-like behavior out of this. It's not completely the same because you have this high density at the very beginning of it, but then it kind of settles into something that is more realistic. And these are different runs of the whole thing. So anyway, so seems like we can actually use it with human fMRI data. So in conclusion, um, you know, Generative manifold networks is a new method that generates embedded representation of brain-wide activity. GMN can produce realistic walking behaviors from flies, and also, um, you know, and also can generate, you know, simulated swimming behavior and simulated joystick behavior from humans, and um, and it also generates, um, you know, realistic recorded neural, it, it takes neural, recorded neural activity and generates uh, realistic looking neural activity. Um, it generates uh, non-repeating realistic brain-wide neural activity. And it appears to be able to generate realistic behaviors that are even not present in the training set, suggesting that maybe there's some kind of emergent property of the network that actually gets captured. And I think that, you know, um, we should be able to use it on a variety of brain-wide data and possibly also other um, nonlinear networks, complex networks. So I think this is not really limited to um, brain activity. You could probably also do this for, let's say, traffic in a city or something like that. So have a simulation that looks realistic of that or any kind of complex network for which you have sufficient data. So finally, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. I've had many of them. So uh, some from the Salk Institute, you know, Chen Min Ye. Um, I collected with her the, the fish data. Um, and then Notita collected the, the human data. And then um, the with Keiichi and, and Wasapon, uh, we did the computation without this would not be possible. We had lots of uh, resources from AIST the, on the computing side. And um, all of this, the original GMN was done just by Cameron Smith and, uh, and myself, you know, during the pandemic that, um, you know, that's how we, uh, when we finally came up with a solution that actually works. And then my, uh, 
funding sources have been like the WM Keck Foundation. There was a innovation grant that I received, uh, AIST for computing, and also the Kavli Institute of Brain and Mind. And I'll take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gerald. That was really interesting. Uh, so let's uh, open it up for questions. Does anybody want to kick it off? Feel free to just jump in. Uh, hey, Gerald. Hi. Good talk. Um, I was just wondering, so the, the original CCM paper by Sidney Hacker has like this um, kind of correlogram and you do the correlation against the original time series for each library length. Um, and so in yours, you've got the CCM statistic in a matrix. I'm wondering which which value that statistic was. Like, was it the maximum? Um, that's the row. That's basically the, your CCM row. Uh, so basically, the, 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 the mean row of the entire time series. Okay, right, sure. For all the, all the values. So basically, if you use the original Sugihara, uh, if you use the original Sugihara thing, it's basically this, uh, the CCM output file that you get. That is basically your the mean for all the predictions that you actually have for the entire time series. Okay, sure, cool. Yeah. At max library length. Yeah. <clears throat> at oh, max at library. maximum library length. Okay. Yeah, at maximum okay. library length. Okay. Yeah, most of the times we hear, um, we don't look at a convergence so much. I'm gonna set it up. Um, uh, we actually go check later whether the convergence is uh, actually happens, but I mean, it increases since in the end, you, you're you going to have some errors, but uh, you can always clean it up afterwards when you, when you go back and, yeah. So do you think convergence is a very important property to kind of infer causality here? Or? Yes, but it's like here you have so much data, you have to, you know, you have to have some compromise. Yeah, especially when you're actually going to use basically a resource like uh, ABCI, where you are limited by the, the time that you can have. So if you're going to have, let's say, you know, even four or five, you know, you know, sub samples of the whole thing, you're going to, you're going to have to at least double the amount of calculations that you have to do. And so what kind of time? Are we looking at time complexity for So basically, this is basically like roughly using um, about the entire, it, it, when we did with CP, uh, CPP EDM, we were using half of ABCI, which was like 512 nodes um, for about nine hours. The actual time was actually 23 and a half hours because there were two nodes that were lagging. And that actually happened like multiple times. That was basically that there's always a couple of nodes that are lagging. But if you have to reserve the time, the actual value that you actually, that if you were to pay, you know, then you would actually have to pay for 24 hours of this thing. Okay. And so, so how many samples around that? I'm just trying to get an idea of how long this. Oh, so that was a uh, that was like 53,000 time series of 1,600 in length. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Feel free to jump in. Uh, I can I can ask a question. So uh, one of the things you noted kind of earlier on was uh, when the fish began to move, you see a reduction, or rather, when they entered this kind of hypoxic state. Uh, there was a reduction in the dimensionality kind of at the maximum. Um, so that distribution shifted to the left, indicating kind of lower dimensional yeah. um, activity for the what you were what you were observing as a whole for the entire network. Yeah. And I was wondering if if when you see behavior like that, um, are you thinking that it's a reduction in noise or an increase instead, kind of an increase in the sinking? Or, or rather it becomes synced, the behavior of the different neurons yeah, become- Yeah, it's, right. it's the second, it's the second. There's like, there's no reduction in noise. We actually had an independent way to check for noise. So we actually right. used, um, uh, had a different method, um, basically to re reduce noise reduction. It doesn't change anything when you reduce the noise, at least with this data. 
but uh, we actually the so it's basically it's much more synchronized and also the the behavioral repertoire is reduced. So that's why you actually see this. And also the time scales right. become much more uniform. Oh, right. Yeah. So the time right, scales right. of the behaviors become much more uniform. So that's basically why you see this dimensionality reduction. Right. And by, okay, so how do you check that the time scales becoming more uniform? Are you looking at, do you vary tau? Yeah, and you then, vary tau. Right. Yeah. So we actually looked into this and then see what is the uh, distribution of tau's for maximum predictability. Right. And then it's basically become narrow. So there's actually a really long, you know, surprisingly long at, you know, 15, 20 second time scale tau that was optimal for a sub for a subset of things that wow. actually just disappeared. So That's basically they just they disappear. Yeah, they completely disappear. So yeah, so the yeah, so every it gets simplified in many different complex ways. That's interesting. 15 to 20 seconds is pretty long. Yes, for... it's an eternity for the brain, right? right. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. But there are, there's a small number of things that there that work at really long time scales that we were really surprised to find. Right. And we're trying to understand the significance of it, but we don't know that yet. Right. I mean, what's the refractory period for a neuron? I mean, it's it's milliseconds, right? I mean... Yeah, it's in the milliseconds. But the, but the, the signals that you get here are not uh, single action potentials because the... Right. Sensor itself is a little bit slow compared to that. Right. right so right, right. what you get what what you get here is sort of a surrogate of the rate code. It's basically if you actually have firing twice as like that, it can becomes brighter, and yeah. the time that it comes down is like if it it keeps firing, then it keeps increasing, and right. then it really it decays. So it decays like um, you know, in like um a fraction of a second. But right. a sampling is like also kind of slow. You're limited by because you have to have so many planes. So yeah. as you scan through the entire thing, it's like uh, it's, uh, it's it's slow compared to the actual behavior of the. Uh, depending on the technique, there so there 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 are a couple of techniques that we use. There are techniques that are faster and slower, but then their signal to noise also changes. So you always compromise something. So right, yeah. But the the GCAM thing is surprisingly robust. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I also had a question about this row diff matrix, which initially uh, you referred to it as a residual matrix and then and then row diff, yeah. um, which is you take the CCM derived matrix of rows yeah. and then you take the linear correlation yeah. uh, matrix yeah. uh, and, sub and subtract the two. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the interpretation of that resulting um, difference. So that that resulting matrix, because in certain cases, I've seen uh, CCM rows fall below linear correlations. Yes. Um, and so what is this, what is the interpretation you give that? It would almost make more sense to me, at least maybe not in terms of the substantive use to which you put that resulting matrix, but if you had maybe a CCM derived matrix and a co-prediction matrix or something, then you know you're, you're, what you're getting there is kind of causal signal versus not. And, and what you're not doing is comparing linear versus non-linear correlation. So with the with the linear correlation, you have you know it could be causal or not, but now you have a difference in potentially the kind of nonlinearity that you're able to pick up. So I'm just wondering, how do you interpret that that difference? Yeah, I mean, it's like this is a this this is more like a heuristic. We actually found this. You know, right. it was not it was not a, basically. I mean, theoretically, it's like it's, it's not a very satisfying heuristic, in the, from a theoretical standpoint. Okay. Actually, the, the things that, and actually we, what we take is the basically, I should, uh, you know, clarify, it's actually the absolute of the correlation matrix. It's not the, so if it's negative, you don't, right. you take the absolute of it. It's not the, okay. you don't the thing. Um, but yeah, so there's basically like, whatever you actually have, basically you're trying to find the nonlinear components within it. That's basically what you're trying to find. You're trying okay. to find the nonlinear components within your network. And if you have the nonlinear components of your network, you find the things that basically you try to get rid of all the redundant information. It's basically a way to break it down and like this, what is the biggest- The filter. Biggest scale stuff that I have yeah. where the stuff is nonlinear and they're not basically, and they don't contain the same information. Okay. Okay. So I think of it that way. Yeah. And then it's basically, and, and the fact is like it, Although, you know, from is yeah, I, I, I we we actually try to find a information theoretical way to do it in a nicer way. Yeah. But 
there is not a whole lot of information theoretical, you know, continuous time series stuff that is out there that has allowed us to get a, you know, get a good metric. So, I mean, I understand yeah, we have the same kind of, especially Joseph that uh, uh, basically we have some caveats on this, but the fact is like, it works so well that <laughs> just go with it. <laughs> right. It's yeah. Not yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, come yeah up I the theory later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's like compressed sensing where people did it for quite some time until there was a, you know, solid theory behind it. Right. It's interesting. It's funny. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Uh, does anybody have any other uh, questions or anything that they'd like to ask Gerald while we have him? Yeah. If not, you can all, you know, if you think of anything later, you can always email me and then, okay, cool. um, yeah. Okay. That's great. Well, obviously we'll, we'll post this to YouTube and, um, and, and you can probably expect some emails as a function of that as sure. well. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gerald. We really appreciate your time and, uh, and sharing with us this fascinating research. Yeah. And, then, um, yeah. and next week, Keiichi will talk about the algorithmic aspects of it and then scaling it up <clears throat> and, um, you know, more in terms of the software development aspect of it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, when I when I announce this, um, the posting of the video to YouTube, I'll Katie, I'll make sure to announce your talk as well. And so everybody, stay tuned for the exciting conclusion of how can you compute this? With uh... <laughs> yeah. thank you so now much. You can, now you can do it with a high end server. You don't need a supercomputer anymore. Sounds great. Well, I'll just go okay. run out and buy one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we got two hundred million dollars sitting around somewhere. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Gerald. Okay, take care. Cheers. Ciao. Bye.